Welcome everybody to another episode of the Talking with Heroes talk show program. I am Bob Calvert, the founder of Talking with Heroes and your host for this program. And uh, TalkingWithHeroes.com is our website and thank you for your service .us. Uh, for those of you who have been watching the recent programs uh, with uh, USAA at their TV studio here in San Antonio and uh, line1.org also in San Antonio. We are now with another organization, another member of the r4alliance.org called VetTrip, uh, www.vettrip.org. It's T-R-I-I-P.org. Um, they are an organization helping with stress, resilience, and relaxation training. Um, they have the Veterans Team Recovery Integrative Immersion Process, which they call Vet Trip, and uh, so we're we're going to be talking with a number of the men and women who are here at one of these uh, retreats. I guess you might call it right. Mm -hmm. And right now we're here with uh, retired Army Colonel John Cook, 40 years of service to our country. First of all, thank you for your service. Thank you. And uh, to tell pe people a little bit about yourself, go back. Obviously. You were in 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, what motivated you to, to become part of the military? And then talk a little bit about your career in the military. Okay. Uh, well, I graduated from high school in 1973, and that just happened to be the year that the United States went from a draft to an all-volunteer army. And I was one of the first kids, I guess, I was a teenager, that signed up for it. Uh, the reason I joined is because there were a lot of prospects for someone uh, who was graduating from a very small uh, high school in Missouri and uh, also my parents were poor I don't know how else to say it and there were seven children in the family uh, my twin brother and I were the oldest so I just uh, sought the army because that's what I always wanted to do and um, and I also wanted to get out of there um, I remember that when I passed the test and uh, the recruiter says, okay, you can pretty much be what you want to be, and that was the term back then, be all you can be. And uh, so I signed up to be a military policeman, and I asked him to get me as far away from Missouri as he could, and he goes, well, I can send you to Vietnam. And I said, can I have a second choice? And he <laughs> goes, sure. Uh, so I ended up, uh, after my advanced individual training, going to uh, Heidelberg, Germany, uh, and there I served for four years as a military policeman. And then uh, I did another tour of duty after that. I re-enlisted for the Presidio San Francisco, which was great. I got out after that time and uh, joined ROTC at UC Berkeley and uh, finished my uh, <clears throat> bachelor's degree and came back on active duty in 1983 as a medical service corps officer. I was selected to go to flight school. So in 84, I went to 1984, I went to flight school uh, graduated a year later, was one of uh, a couple guys that got picked in 1985 to uh, go right into the Black Hawk transition. I did that and then uh, I was sent to Panama for my first flying assignment. I did that, flew all, all over Central South America, found that was a great place to learn how to fly this new aircraft, the Black Hawk. I uh, did, uh, did three years there and then uh, came back and uh, went through about a year's full of training and then became an instructor at uh, Fort Sam Houston, or Joint Base San Antonio now. Um, I did that for three years and during that span of time I was, uh, because they needed my skill as a pilot, I flew during uh, Desert Storm with a unit out of Germany, uh, <clears throat> which I would later come back and uh, command one of the units. But anyway, so I came back from Desert Storm, I did another year, and then they sent me to Baylor University to get a master's degree in healthcare. And <clears throat> then I did my residency back in Heidelberg, that's where I was as a private, as an MP, and so it was wonderful, and that's actually where I met my wife, uh, who also worked at the hospital as a German working for the American government in the hospital. So I did uh, that for three years, and then I was selected to be an aviation commander. I went to Kotterbach, Germany, close to Nuremberg, 
and served for 28 months as an aviation medevac commander and flew missions all over Europe and uh, deployed the unit to the Balkans uh, for several months and did that. Then went up after that assignment to uh, Wiesbaden, Germany to be the executive officer of the aviation unit. And from there I was selected to go to Washington, D.C. where I was the assignments officer for about a thousand uh, Medical Service Corps officers around the world. After that I was selected to go to command. My wife and I went to Las Vegas, Nevada, if you can believe it. Uh, and I was a recruiting commander, but only for uh, health care professionals, doctors, nurses, and, and the such. And I had the battle space, as we call it, about half of the United States to include uh, <clears throat> Korea, Hawaii, Guam, Alaska. Uh, so that was, that was uh, exciting, but it was a lot of work. After that, my wife and I got, were fortunate enough to be stationed in Hawaii for two years. And then I was selected uh, to attend the War College, which in the medical side of the house is a big deal because it's only 1% that gets selected. I went to the Industrial College of the Armed Forces in Washington, D.C., graduated a year later, and then took a brigade command. I had the Army's largest training brigade here at Fort Sam Houston, you know, for all combat medics and uh, officer trainings. Combat medics, a lot of people don't know that it's the second largest MOS after the infantry uh, in the Army. After I did that for two years, the commanding general asked me to be the chief of staff for him and for Fort Sam Houston. So I did that for a year and then I was selected to command uh, the hospital at Fort Campbell with the great 101st Airborne Division. So I went there and worked for a truly great leader, John Campbell, who went on to be the vice chief of staff of the Army and uh, he was he commanded the forces in Afghanistan. Once I finished was that, with that, the, uh, our, my commanding general asked me of the Corps <clears throat> if I would be the deputy commander of the Medical Service Corps, came back to Fort Sam Houston, and did that. I guess the only thing I left out is when I transitioned from enlisted uh, to going to college, uh, the day that I signed out of the Army active duty, I signed into the active reserves. Uh, with an infantry division for three years in the Bay Area. So I never had a break in, in, active, in active service. And the only reason I left in, uh, on October 31st, uh, Halloween, in 2013, was I had the proverbial government bayonet in my back saying I was out of time. I couldn't spend any more time in. So I've worked hard the last three years and the first year was tough for me, but I've worked hard the last three years with the help of my wonderful wife uh, and have made a great transition into this thing called retirement. So, first of all, again, thank you for your service. I guess that from the smiles I'm seeing over here, your wife's sitting right over here, right? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Good guess on my part. <laughs> and the German accent. <laughs> um, so, uh, real briefly, if you don't mind, because I want to ask you about that trip too. Talk about family in the military, because we, we've had a number of people we've talked to at USAA where mm -hmm. they're talking about what it was like for their children, for the spouse, and, and especially with all the moves in the military and all that. Yeah. Well, the only thing I will say, my long experience in the Army is is that, you know, like, every, like I would assume it's the same with everyone, but everything is so much more dramatic in the military because you know every two to three years you're going to, you're going to leave. Your family's going to pull up roots and move. And so, and the other big piece of that is several times during your career, depending on how long you stay in, you're going to deploy. And that has a huge effect on your family, period. Um, I can tell you, I, as a, you know, I had the privilege of commanding four different times as a field grade officer. And regardless, you know, we were flying helicopters in, in, in combat zones and all that, but at the forefront, of what was always going on were uh, the soldiers and people's families. And so if we did not help, if we didn't understand that as leaders, if we didn't connect with that with our own families, then it was very difficult to actually accomplish these missions. And we obviously weren't sitting at a typewriter, so the mission, you had to have your head in the game, always. and. If things weren't okay at home, it, 
uh, it, it wasn't going to go as well as it should. And so I have seen in my 40 years a movement of the Army from where you came in and you were a soldier and they didn't issue you a wife or a family to the realization that they are the centerpiece. And if they, if they don't get briefed on the mission and you're not communicating with your, your family, then the chances of you making it through a full career and being as productive as you could be, um, it went down exponentially. And the, I think the Army's done a really great job with that. That's the only way that we can retain, we don't just retain soldiers today, we have to retain the family, or it's okay. just not gonna work. Okay, I appreciate that. As most people watching, they've been watching maybe previous videos, they know that we've been talking with a lot of military support groups, recreational wellness groups, uh, many of them started by veterans themselves. Mm -hmm. And what brought you to VetTrip and what's been your experience? Well, I actually uh, came to VetTrip a couple months ago uh, by the recommendation of one of my health care providers. I had never heard of it. Um, but uh, she asked me if I was willing to try some alternative uh, health care, and I said, absolutely. I mean, my wife is about as holistic as they come, so she was like, yes, I don't care if you do anything else, but you're going to go to this. Um, so I came with uh, a very open mind. I wasn't quite sure uh, what it was going to be or about, but I can tell you, based on the personalities of the people that greeted you from day one, and talking you through the process and I mean really I mean physically emotionally and spiritually putting their arms around you uh, at a level that you just will not get in the sterile environment of a hospital um, I've only been here twice and it has made an incredible impression on me both physically emotionally and spiritually so talk about what your experiences have been as far as coming through this and knowing that you're feeling better and yeah. what, what was the techniques that you benefited from? Well first of all I uh, when I was in Bosnia which I had mentioned earlier I had gotten bit by a tick and make a long story short it went it, four different doctors learned, looked at it because I started to have neurological problems and this was in the late 90s uh, they found out it was a tick they put me on antibiotics um, well, you know, after I retired um, in, in 2013, a couple of years later, I started to have real problems with my joints. And I mean, never anything that painful. And there was just nothing that I could do for it. And I refused to take pain medications because I had a twin brother who died last year. Uh, and it's, his death really was contributed, attributed directly to oxycodone and pain medication. So I'm, I'm very weary of that. So when I came here, the hope was is that I would learn some skills or receive some sort of uh, provision that would allow me to lessen the pain. And I can tell you that it is, I'm not, I don't understand it all, but it is a combination of holistic health care. And most of it goes back thousands of years for instance, acupuncture, and we all we know that uh, massage therapy, aromatherapy, a lot of these different techniques, and the thing is amazing is they basically <clears throat> introduced you and your body to all of these at one time. And the session lasted, I guess, about two hours because I almost lost a sense of time. And there was also the, the music. And I'm gonna tell you, you know, uh, I have uh, received a lot of health care in my life, but up to this point in time, this, as crazy as it sounds, this is probably the most productive um, and, and results-driven uh, medical care that I've received. And a big part of that, which was, it almost didn't seem real, that the, the passion that the providers the kindness uh, that everyone showed you in introducing you into this process, the sincerity uh, in which this product is delivered um, has not only made an impression upon my mind, which is part of 
of the of, of the healing cycle, but certainly upon my body. Uh, when I came here over a month ago, I was having a hard time walking, and it was very painful to stand. Uh, and like I said, I've, I've suffered a lot of pain in 40 years. I'm airborne, air assault, commando, French command, all that stuff. But this was the first time in my life uh, when I really felt a true, truly enveloped uh, in the healing process. You know, are, do my knee, do my uh, joints still hurt? Yes, they do. But I am walking. Uh, now with a lot less pain and probably more importantly is it's made me realize that there is there are other avenues to healing and uh, so from that perspective you know I've, I've started to look at different uh, avenues of approach uh, I'm taking a couple natural uh, medications now that I would have never thought before of taking and my only response has been where has this been? You know, and I know you, you know, having worked in healthcare a little bit, that you have to balance who's, who's running the industry, all the pharmaceuticals and all that, with, you know, concepts of healthcare that have been around for thousands of years. Acupuncture, being around, I have never experienced that until here. But talking to someone, I was like, you know, it's been around for 5,000 years for a reason. And one of those reasons is, is it's got to work at some level. Right. And so I don't really question a lot of this. I just know that when you come in and they ask you what your pain level is and it's high, and two hours later you leave and it's almost zero, no one is going to tell me that something in there doesn't work. Exactly. So you, you'll be continuing to come back? Or is it something you do on you can do again? Or yes, as a matter of fact, uh, I am thrilled that uh, I get this opportunity. I, I am truly appreciative, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, I will come back as long as they allow me to, uh, because you know I, I get I get some health care here from them, and I get it here. But what this has allowed me is in between to educate myself and take better care of myself and to um, use some of the techniques that they teach you here because it's not just providing health care they're also teaching you how to better care for yourself. Excellent. Well thank you for sharing all this. I really, really appreciate it and I know the people watching right now will appreciate it too. With your 40 years of experience in the military including hospital running a hospital and everything you've done to come to here and find alternative, like you said, alternative methods that probably should have been be told us, we should be, be knowing about anyway. Well, right? thank you. And, yeah. and the only thing that I would tell the audience out there is, you know, we get raised in a certain way to think a certain way, and that's all good. And the health care in our country is second to none. But let's all remember that, uh, and we are kind of good heading back there, there are alternatives. Um, and all you got to do is explore them. I mean, just common sense should tell all of us that uh, a thousand years, five hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, there were a lot of remedies that people were work that, that that were healing them, and a lot of that is just being rediscovered in our society today. And I can tell you, uh, vet trips, that is that piece of the puzzle that at least at this point in my life I was looking for. And I really appreciate the fact that they are there, and they are there in a loving way to support the soldiers. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad you're able to be here and benefit like this. It's very encouraging to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before we go, if you could just kind of look at the camera. And, you know, we have a lot of soldiers. Numbers seem to be growing again, deployed in different parts of the world, many in harm's way. Why don't you give a shout-out, a message to them? Okay. Um, I just want to say to all the soldiers that are stationed around the world, uh, you know the old saying, been there, done that. I know where you are. I know what you're doing. I know the sacrifices that you are providing to this country. And I also know that you're doing it for the person to your left and your right. So I'm asking you, take care of yourself. Take care of the people on your left and right and take care of your family. 
because while you're serving us, uh, it's important that you that you take care of yourself and set that as a, as a leadership example for everyone. But again, thank you for everything that you do. Okay, thank you. Well, folks, you've been hearing us on TalkingWithHeroes.com, and just like the previous videos that are coming out, and we've been doing for actually a few years now with all these different nonprofits across the country, and but working with for-profits like USAA. If you haven't watched those videos yet, please go back to the YouTube page and watch them. Um, very powerful, and if you know somebody that could possibly benefit from this, please let them have an opportunity to watch this. And I also want to give a shout out before we close to our troops. Um, if you're in an area where you could be in harm's way, be safe, stay alert. God bless you. And we look forward to you coming home real soon. And we'll be back with more from San Antonio, Texas with VetTrip.org.